Good evening and welcome. Um, really delighted to welcome everybody here uh, for a talk by Professor Michael Link, um, International Law and the New War on Gaza is the title of it. Uh, tonight's event is part of the Palestine Speaker Series, which was started by two members of our faculty, Professor Abdel al Aryan and Professor Karine Walder. Um, and we, more than a year ago, and we have uh, this year alone uh, welcomed uh, Shireen Seqali, Omar Shaker um, as part of that series. And that's, of course, in addition uh, to a number of things we have been doing to bring um, the education on Palestine and providing opportunities to learn about the history and provide a context that helps us understand uh, the current situation to our students and our general public. Uh, we have introduced a new program for visiting fellows. We had Omar Shaker as a visiting fellow here in September. Uh, he taught a one credit course, Michael, that was wonderful on, um, on, on the, the uh, legal um, sort of aspects of uh, dealing with um, the issue of apartheid as it uh, led to the publication of the Human Rights uh, Watch uh, report with that. Next week, uh, the week after, we will host uh, Professor Wadiya Saeed, uh, another legal scholar from the University of Colorado, who will be with us here for a couple of weeks. Um, things that are also unrelated to the speaker series, but nonetheless relevant. Uh, tomorrow we will have a film showing and discussion, uh, The Killing of Shireen Abu Akla, um, Gaza in Context. Uh, this will take place tomorrow at 1 o'clock at Sears, uh, the Center for International and Regional Studies here at Georgetown. Uh, we also launched this past week a partnership with the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies and the Al Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding on our main campus in Washington, D.C. Uh, we participate also with them and with Rutgers University and George Mason University um, in a series called the Gaza Teach-In. Um, is that correct, China? Yeah. Uh, which, which launched last Friday. Um, we're doing a bunch of things uh, with the main campus. And this event tonight is actually being um, live streamed and available for students and faculty on our main campus to, um, to participate in. Uh, we're all, this is all part of what I refer to as our Palestine Studies Program, uh, an initiative that started uh, last year and has taken on greater urgency, of course, in the uh, days and weeks past. So, um, to welcome Professor Michael Link, let me say a couple of things about him. Uh, first of all, he is of Lebanese descent, or Syrian-Lebanese descent. Uh, Professor Emeritus of Law at Western University in London, Ontario, uh, in Canada. He has practiced and taught labor law, constitutional law, and human rights law, specializing in refugee law. Uh, he's written widely on labor law and human rights problems in Canada and has published articles on the application of international law to the Middle East region. In 2016, Professor Link was appointed UN Special Rapporteur on human rights and the situation in the occupied Palestinian territories. He delivered regular reports to the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council on the human rights situation in the occupied Palestinian territories. In March, on March 22, 2022, he submitted his last report to the UN Human Rights Council, which concluded that the situation in the occupied territories amounts to the crime of apartheid. Um, on the 30th of August this past year, this year, so just a couple of months ago, uh, Michael briefed the UN Committee on the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People in New York on the findings of the study it had commissioned regarding the legality of the Israeli occupation concerning the Palestine case before the International Court of Justice. 
He's written about his UN experience in a 2022 book co-authored with Richard Falk, uh, Richard Falk from Princeton University, um, and John Dugard, two of his predecessors as UN Special Rapporteurs. Uh, the book is entitled Protecting Human Rights in Occupied Palestine, Working Through the United Nations. Now, conducting the conversation uh, and acting as an interlocutor with Professor Link is Professor Khaled al uh, who teaches at Northwestern University in Qatar, next door. Uh, Professor al who is a Palestinian academic, his research focuses on Middle Eastern studies and politics with particular interest in Islam and politics, Palestine, and Arab media studies. He is the author of Hamas, A Beginner's Guide, Hamas, Political Thought and Practice, and Religious Broadcasting in the Middle East. And these are only a few of the books that Professor Hrub has published in English. In Arabic, he authored Fragility of Ideology and Might of Politics. That's the translation. In Praise of Revolution and The Anxious Intellectual versus the Certain Intellectual. He also writes prose and poetry. So without farther, further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Lenk. We're very, very grateful to you, Michael, for making time available to come and share your experience and your insights with us. And Professor Khaled al we are very grateful to you for bringing Professor Link to us and for conducting this conversation. So thank you and please welcome them. So, oh, okay, that's very good. Um, so far, uh, many thanks for the very generous introduction for uh, the event, for Professor Link and myself. And let me welcome you all again. Uh, and thank you for your participation and coming and joining us to this event. Initially, we wanted to invite uh, Professor Link to talk about uh, very conceptual ideas uh, relating to the apartheid system in Palestine. Um, benefiting from his engagement in drafting many of the, the reports uh, describing the situation in Palestine as an apartheid system, or at least to use the exact maybe terminology of uh, those reports to be mitigated, that it amounts to apartheid system. Um, However, a few days before his arrival, Armageddon uh, took <coughs> place, and we started to witness the genocidal war against the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. So we decided to shift the focus of our talk, and instead of discussing maybe conceptual, theoretical uh, ideas, now we have a case study, unfortunately, uh, happening before our eyes. Uh, so we decided to uh, examine the legality, or, uh, the illegality, in fact, of uh, what is happening in, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the way we are going to handle this uh, evening is th as follows. We will have a Professor Link to give us an opening commentary or remarks, maybe about his experience, and then as an entry point to our discussion. And then we will have a conversation here hopefully for 20, 25 minutes, and then open the floor for your discussions and questions uh, here in the audience. So, uh, Michael, you can have maybe five to seven minutes uh, as introductory comments the, w the way you like. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a great honor and a great delight to, uh, to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, I wish it was under better circumstances. Um, but these are, are important questions for our time to be able to discuss, uh, to debate, and try to find solutions with this. When I was asked to speak, um, I, I was trying to think of an opening quote uh, to, to give you. And to me, the appropriate one comes from somebody 
that you all know of, and I hope many of you have wound up re reading. Um, in his 1946 essay, In Front of Your Nose, George Orwell said the following. He said, we are all capable of believing things that we know to be untrue. And then when we are finally proved wrong, in prudently twisting the facts so as to show that we were right intellectually, it, uh, sorry, that we were right intellectually, it is possible to carry on this process for an indefinite time. The only check on it is whether or not a false belief bumps up against solid reality, usually on a battlefield. And this thought occurred to me when I remember reading a comment made in late September or early October by Jake Sullivan, who is the President Biden's national security advisor. And he had just come back from a, from a trip to Israel um, and uh, he was quoted on his return as saying, the Middle East is quieter than it's ever been in decades. And I thought to myself, well, he must have been briefed by Netanyahu. And it, I realized that then, obviously, as the events occurred beginning on the 7th of, uh, of August, how many illusions have been shattered, beginning, obviously, with the Israelis, um, that they think they could have thought that this, this is an, an occupation that they can manage indefinitely. Indeed, if we think back 45 years, um, Moshe Dayan, who at the time in the late 1970s was the Minister of Defense, he was asked by an American journalist about how they plan to solve uh, the, the question of Palestine or, or end the occupation. And he answered, he said, the question is not how to find a solution, the question is how to manage the occupation. In other words, this is indefinite, but also this is a constant strain throughout Israeli leadership ever since 1948. And that continues as well with the American belief that they could pivot away from, uh, from the Middle East, turn their attention largely to, uh, to challenges in the, in the Pacific, and say to Israel, as long as you're managing the occupation, um, we will not interfere. And it would appear, and, and who knows what the weeks and months will come, but I think we can make some educated guesses in this room tonight, but would have appeared up until October 7th that, uh, that Joe Biden was going to be the very first American president since Gerald Ford not to launch even a pretend peace process with respect to this. If you followed several of his speeches uh, in September of 2021, and I believe in September of 2022 at the uh, UN General Assembly in September of each of those years, he said, I believe in a two-state solution. Unfortunately, that's a long ways fr uh, from us right now. In other words, this is not even on the back burner of, uh, of the American consciousness. So you might be asking yourself, well, what does a special rapporteur or former special rapporteur have to do with this? Um, I, uh, I was a labor lawyer, as, it, as uh, has been uh, explained by the, uh, by the dean, um, and I worked most of my life either working for unions or as a labor arbitrator, and for the last 20 some years as, as a law professor, primarily in, in labor law. But I never forget my, if you like, my origins. I skipped my law school graduation to spend six weeks in the West Bank in 1981. You can figure out, you can date, date me by then by doing carbon, carbon dating. Um, and uh, I went back regularly. I went back for six months in 1989 and worked for UNRWA during the height of the first Palestinian Intifada throughout the West Bank. Um, I was back uh, again in 1996 working with the Canadian government to invigilate the first Palestinian uh, elections. Um, and I did not go back in 2016 when I was appointed uh, as Special Rapporteur because Israel would not allow me in. So I spent the six years as Special Rapporteur, uh, which is a voluntary unpaid position, I should say. I worked full time, I kept my day job as a law professor. Uh, I traveled regularly to the region, usually to, uh, to, uh, to Amman, to meet um, human rights organizations there. And of course what I learned was, is that the human rights organizations, Palestinian, Israeli, and, um, and international groups, produced absolutely top-rate reports 
on all the trends that were going on, uh, human rights trends that were going on in the occupied Palestinian territory. Uh, and what I also learned was while Palestine, the question of Palestine, is the best documented human rights crisis in the world today, by far. It was very easy for me if I wasn't able to get into the West Bank or, or to Gaza or to East Jerusalem. I had a plethora of excellent reports to work from. This is the best documented human rights crisis in the world, but it is far from the best reported human rights crisis uh, in the world today. And in the course of my reports, of course, as a lawyer, I would have tried to rely upon the framework of international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and among other reports, I focused on several issues that I, I'm very proud of today that I think are very pertinent to this, this dark moment that we're in right now. I actually uh, issued three of my 12 reports on the theme of accountability or the lack of it. Um, in the Middle East, and I say this with regret as a lawyer, international law is closer to power than it is to justice. Which, of course, for any international lawyer, uh, it winds up breaking one's heart because international law is not meant to be an umbrella that folds up at the first sign of rain. Um, and as I was saying before we, we came on stage, at the very beginning of my, uh, of my tenure as Special Rapporteur in 2016, um, I had sworn to myself, and I've written about this, that I would never use the word apartheid. That, yeah, it floats around, but it sometimes sounds to me more like a slogan uh, or a slur than anything else. I'm going to talk about the principles of international humanitarian law and the Fourth Geneva Convention. I'm going to talk about international human rights law and how it applies. And I, then I will go to the diplomats from North America and to Europe and I'll say, this is your law and these are resolutions you've either voted for at the UN or you're now committed to enforcing. All you have to do is do that and we will end this occupation. And towards the end of my six years, I realized I was speaking to a brick wall, to deaf ears. International law to them meant nothing. It was flexible. It was soft law. It was, um, it was a, a, an option to choose when it was going to suit you, and it was something to put aside when it, uh, the rules of international law wind up opposing uh, you. And this, if you like, led me to believe that the only thing left for me to do in my 12th and final report was then examine the question of apartheid. And for those of you who, re, who have studied this for a long period of time and see really nothing changing on the ground, what I can say to you in the, five, in the six years that I was Special Rapporteur is how rapidly the language and the vocabulary with respect to subjugation and oppression changed. In 2016, Aside from a few, and I, I, I don't say this at all disparagingly because they've done heroic work from several smaller Palestinian human rights groups, no one was using the word apartheid. And then uh, Human Rights Watch issued a major report on it. And then uh, Amnesty International did. And then the law clinic, International Law Clinic at Harvard did. And then Beth Salem and uh, uh, Al-Haq and uh, Al-Mazan issued reports, and then I issued my, my report. And today, among the international human rights community, apartheid is a common word to, re, to refer to um, the Israeli occupation of Palestine. That this is an occupation that has been transformed into annexation that has become metastasized into apartheid. And slowly, slowly, it, even in my parliament uh, in, in Ottawa, as a Canadian, I'm beginning to hear the word apartheid begin to use by opposition MPs when they're asking questions of government ministers. It works. In the last few weeks, and uh, the word genocide has begun to arise. And there was a statement made by, I believe initially 800 international lawyers and, and international scholars, um, who um, a, a very profound, I think, and very convincing a statement with respect to genocide. And just like it took three to five years for apartheid, if you like, to find its intellectual and political legs, 
so that it's now entered into the vocabulary. The same thing I think will now become uh, so with respect to genocide. What's going on before our eyes over the course of the last two weeks has engendered, I think, a uprising, uh, intellectual uprising uh, among international scholars and international lawyers uh, when it comes to this. And that this uh, document has now attracted well over a thousand names, including mine, uh, that say that there is at least a prima facie case that genocide is occurring with respect to the Palestinian people. And what we need are committed intellectuals willing to use the rigorous tools of, of law and diplomacy to analyze the situation as to whether or not it meets the definitions set out in Articles 1 and Articles 2 of the, uh, of the 1948 uh, Geneva Convention. The other, and one of the other reports that I issue that I think has legs today is a report I did in 2020 as Special Rapporteur with respect to collective punishment. And this will be my last closing remark before I, I turn it over to, to questions. But I wanted to be able to explain this to you. Collective punishment is an anathema to any modern si legal system that counts itself as being guided by the rule of law. Why? Nobody should be punished for crimes they didn't commit that may have been committed by others in their race or religion or ethnicity or nationality. Collective punishment is, is forbidden in every single modern national legal code. It is also forbidden in the international law as well. Article 33 of the, of the Fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, and the Geneva Conventions have been signed by 196 nation states, including Israel, including the United States, and including, I'm glad to say, Palestine as well. So in my report in 2020, I looked at several different aspects of the way in which Israel conducts uh, collective punishment in its, in its operation of, uh, of uh, its occupation over the Palestinians. And the main part of my report had to do with Gaza. The fencing in of over two million people by comprehensive air, sea, and land blockade since 2007. Um, and tell me, and many of you are international scholars, and tell me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> because I, for the life of me, cannot think of another situation anywhere comparable in the world where that many people are actually physically penned up and penned in to, uh, uh, to a small strip of land where they cannot, uh, they cannot leave unless given permission only after a long bureaucratic process and only if either they get a card enough to be, uh, that enables them to work in Israel for a day and then have to come back or they get a health permission to be able to go to the hospitals in Jerusalem or in the West Bank because the hospitals are so ill-equipped in Gaza, they, they cannot do more than primary health care with respect to that. The World Bank, and then these are some of the figures that I wind up relying upon, and none of them have really changed. The World Bank said in 2022 that the unemployment rate in Gaza is between 45 and 50% for the population. That is the highest unemployment rate of any economic unit that the World Bank examines on a, on a yearly basis. When it comes to water, potable water, the absolute essential for human existence, the coastal aquifer, which is the only aquifer that feeds Gaza, 97% of the water is not, not usable for human consumption because it's been contaminated by seawater or by sewage. Electricity, electricity before October 7th was um, somewhere between eight to 12 hours a day if there was enough diesel fuel to be able to pump and, and generate by the, uh, the power plants uh, that, are, uh, that are in Gaza. Um, the healthcare system is flat on its back because it cannot import sufficient numbers of, of modern medical equipment and modern, modern pharmaceuticals, even for to meet the primary care needs of the population. Gazans uh, are relatively well educated, but the unemployment rate among Gazans under the age of 29 is somewhere between 55 and 70 percent, depending 
on the fluctuation. The per capita GDP of, of Gaza in 2012 was $1,800 American. By 2022, it was $1,400 uh, American. One of the very few economies to, to suffer that kind of slippage going backwards. Um, for all these reasons, uh, Gaza already was a humanitarian crisis. After October 7th, it's a humanitarian catastrophe on its way to becoming a humanitarian calamity. Um, there are many things I can, uh, I can tell you with respect to international law. I'll let them come out either in the questions that we'll have now or the questions that you want to ask. But, I'll, but the one interesting thing is that there is suddenly this amazing thirst by journalists over the last two weeks about how law winds up applying to a situation like Gaza. I have been asked more times by the National um, Radio and Television Service in Canada, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, I've spoken more times to them in the last two weeks than I ever spoke to them in the six years that I was, uh, uh, that I was special, special rapporteur. And that goes, of course, to a, a different sort of question that, uh, of, uh, of the term except for Palestine, yeah. uh, where, where human rights yeah. wind, winds up applying and of the interest w uh, with respect to that. But what I said to them, and I'll, I'll, this is what I'll, I'll, I'll leave off with, is that we have one common measuring stick for human rights, and it's based and, uh, and grounded in human dignity and the protection of, uh, of civilians. What Hamas did in terms of, uh, of the fighting that took place directed at civilians, and I know it was not all directed at civilians, but the fighting that was directed at civilians is probably a war crime the shooting of, uh, of rockets into Israeli uh, civilian areas is probably a war crime. The kidnapping of civilians, not soldiers, but civilians, is quite likely a war crime. But what I insisted upon saying in my commentaries to the CBC and to other networks as well uh, that I was interviewed by is that war crimes by one side does not justify war crimes by another. And just as usual, because I think you can point this to almost any situation that Israel has been involved in in the last 15 years with respect to Gaza, Israel doesn't know anything but how, how to commit vastly disproportionate reaction to this. And I'm sorry, I have one last thought, <laughs> okay? And you're allowed to cut me off after I this one. I can't stop you, can I? Okay. <laughs> is I do want to point out that th this is the sixth major assault on Gaza in the last 15 years. In three of the prior assaults, in 2008, 2009, in 2014, and again after the Great March of Return in 2018. In, e in the aftermath a math of each of those three situations, the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, which is the council that, that appointed me as Special Rapporteur, they commissioned independent international reports on, uh, on whether there were war crimes committed in each of those three occasions. And the reports, comprehensive, detailed, persuasive, in each of those three occasions said, certainly on the first two, had said that yes, Hamas had probably committed war crimes, Israel had committed disproportionate uh, war crimes with respect to this. I'll just quote from one of them, which is the, the so-called Goldstone Report from 2009. It said, from the facts uh, gathered, the mission found that the following grave breaches of the Fourth Geneva Convention were committed by the Israeli Armed Forces in Gaza, willful killing, torture, or an inhumane treatment, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health, an extensive destruction of property not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully and warrantly. As grave breaches, these acts give rise to individual criminal responsibility. I could, fall, I could give you the same sort of language in the Davis report that was issued in 2015 after the 2014 assault, and then from the 2019 report that was issued after the mass killings of mostly unarmed uh, Palestinians approaching the fence in Gaza during the Great March of Return in, in 2018. And what the Goldstone Report also said was that there was a 
prevailing culture of lack of accountability and impunity. What it said was, and uh, the quote, I don't have it here, but it, I think I can, I can paraphrase it because I've said it so often in the last several weeks, that there was a justice crisis in the occupied Palestinian territory. Each of those three reports were accepted by the, Internet, by the UN Human Rights Council. Each of those three reports then were shelved. I'm sure they found their way to the uh, prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, but nothing was learned. Each of those dark moments uh, portended that there would be even more darker moments to come. And here we are, because there is lack of accountability and impunity uh, when it comes to Israel and Palestine. There is no conflict in the modern world where, um, where the series of breaches, serious breaches of international law and UN resolutions is so comprehensively gathered and known by the international community. There is no uh, conflict in the world, no occupation in the world, where it is so obvious that the occupying power is operating in bad faith, in violation of many of its profound, of its use Kogan's um, obligations. There is no crisis in the world where the dispossessed and the vulnerables, the suffering that they're going through, has been reported through the UN to the international community, and yet so little has been done uh, dip diplomatically. This is an international legal crisis and an international diplomacy crisis of the first order, and no one should be surprised by where we are today. Antonio Guterres, in his eloquent speech last night to the, um, uh, to the uh, Security Council, and I was, I was actually in the studios at Al Jazeera last night watching this, uh, he said, this has a background to it. This is with context. And then from that, the uh, Israeli UN ambassador said, he has to resign. You should not be saying that. This is entirely unprovoked. But it has a context, it has legs, it has a deep history with respect to this. And any of us who were paying attention um, should have seen that something, like, that the cork was gonna fly off the volcano again and erupt with even greater ferocity uh, than before. Let me end there. Yeah, and then we... uh, thank you very much, Michael. I think in every single sentence that we have heard, I think I could have some follow-up questions, and this is uh, very enlightening and, and informative. Uh, and especially with the very last stretch when we bring in the context, um, because part of the media, part of the media narrative nowadays, the dominant one um, controlled by Western media and Israeli media, is not to mention the context, mm -hmm. as if the history starts on the 7th of October. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been on, on some many media, uh, Western media, and they wouldn't accept this. And there is even uh, for some, some of us who deal with the media, and maybe you have been there as well, there is a new technique for me, I think, we need to, to examine, which some of these, they would say, yeah, yeah, we know there is a context. We know the Palestinians have been occupied for long. But let us focus now, and then they would move the discussion mm -hmm. directly. Mm -hmm. So they allow you, they give you one sentence or two, acknowledging the very long context, and then saying, OK, satisfied now? So let's talk about you know, the 7th of October, which is unacceptable, of course, because this is a very long story. And as you have said, at least the very short context, which is the blockade on Gaza that goes for 16 years. I keep saying, and maybe I need your comment on this, because uh, it links up with the management of the occupation. So things are moving normally. We have been living and witnessing what I call silent and quiet death. And this should be within the, within the acceptable rate. So if you have 100, maybe 200 people die every year under the radar, there is no big deal. Unless you have something big, war, uh, invasion, maybe operation, military operation like this one, and then the Palestinians would scream out and to draw the attention of the whole world. 
as long as the silent and the quiet death goes on at that rate, and I give you one example, then I maybe, if you can comment on mm -hmm. the management of the occupation the, 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 in Gaza Strip for 16 years. Uh, one of the observations or one of the areas where, where you can see silent death is the medical care, of course. Mm -hmm. I've been engaged in, in a documentary about Palestinian women with the breast cancer. Uh, horrifying stories. You don't have sufficient health care. And then the most extreme cases, they have to have Israeli permission to leave the Gaza Strip to, to be treated. And then they will be waiting. On the average, every single year, we have the red death between 40 to 60, depending on the year, of these women dying while waiting for that permit. Who cares about these women? But this is part of the silent death that, that has been happening in every single aspect. And then you can think of heart disease, I don't know, uh, kidney failure, you name it. In the education, in, in, in every single thing. So the, the occupation and the silent death was, was managed for Israel perfectly well. Nobody cares as long as it was acceptable. So what does the humanitarian international law do in these cases? Not only in the Gaza Strip, this applies to the West Bank as well. We have another case of silent, silent death continuously going on. You, you've covered a, a wide range with respect to that. Um, I said that um, in my 2020 report, I had called the blockade at that time, the 13-year-old uh, blockade uh, on Gaza uh, to be collective punishment, a absolute prohibition with no exceptions, uh, uh, prohibition under uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention. I wasn't the first to say that. Ban Ki-moon in his last year, in June of 2016, visited Gaza and said, you know, this is what I've seen t uh, in the last couple of days, visiting all of you uh, in Gaza. Um, is collective punishment for which there must be accountability. Um, and one of my first reports uh, was on the right to health. And I, was, I, I turned to three important organizations, civil society organizations. I turned to the Palestine Red Crescent Society. I turned to Gisha, which is an heroic um, uh, Israeli organization based in uh, in Tel Aviv that does very good work on trying to improve freedom of uh, movement for, uh, for Gazans, particularly uh, those people and those women who require uh, the permission from uh, Israeli authorities to be able to go to either Jerusalem or the West Bank for medical treatment, uh, and also from medical aid for Palestine uh, based, in the, uh, based in the United Kingdom. All have done exceptionally good work for this. But this is, if you look at even the, um, uh, the, health ex the life expectancies, but you compare them just between Gaza and the West Bank, there's a gap, of, uh, the last time I checked, of between five and seven years uh, of life expectancy uh, with respect to that. In part, as I said, it's almost impossible to be able to do anything beyond primary health care in, uh, in the hospitals in, uh, uh, in Gaza because of the lack of equipment. You have an extraordinary dedicated healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, uh, technicians, who work heroically with the little that they wind up having. Um, and I have a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. L uh, Tarek Lubani, who lives in the same city I do in London, in, in London, Ontario, who is Gazan by, uh, by origin, who he himself has now been inventing using 3D printers how to build $5 stethoscopes, how to do other testing equipment, and then training the doctors in Gaza whenever he's able to get in there uh, with, with respect to this. But the, the right, the fundamental right to health in Palestine in general, and in Gaza in particular, under international law, is violated by the, uh, by the weight of the, uh, of, the Palestinian, of the Israeli occupation. Uh, with respect to that. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, sorry, uh, Michael, I want uh, to take you back to the media um, uh, question because I think it's very crucial, very central, and very dominating nowadays. Um, I know may, this may sound very trivial, but can we place any role of, for the international uh, law or humanitarian even law mm -hmm. in terms of uh, what is happening in the media? Because the media is complicit. The media is part of this war crime. Now, we investigate and, and, and examine what is happening on the ground. This is part, this is great, fantastic. But what's happening on the media as well in, mm -hmm. in, in covering or uncovering, in disinforming, misinforming, is, is just amazing nowadays. I checked, you know, last week, guys, on the 16th of October, there was a UN report published. Nobody cared about it. That is, we had 9,000 people killed in Sudan over the past couple of months. Nobody, nobody cared about that. So for the vast majority of us, I guess, and even worldwide, the value of human beings are greatly different. If you are a Palestinian, or, or if you are a Sudanese, or if you belong uh, to, maybe to African or Asian uh, origin, you have less of a value of your life. If you are an Israeli, or if you are a white origin, you have much higher value. So I think there is a need, there is something that should be done regarding this. Is there any role, I know maybe I want kind of passionate or emotional, but is there any role for international law in, 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 in addressing this? Sure. Um, I want to say that law doesn't solve everything, um, though lawyers like to think it can solve a great deal. But what I think is needed is, and we're already starting this in Canada, those of us who have a history with respect to the question of Israel and Palestine, those of us who serve there in one way or another, um, what we're doing now is, uh, is not only writing letters uh, for op-eds to the newspapers explaining the intricacies of the laws of war when it comes to, to this, but also pointing out if you like the natural biases with respect to the, you know, the color of your skin or the distance by which you, uh, uh, you are away from, uh, from North America. We are also, and I'm in the process of doing this now, trying to compose a two to four page primer on international law and what it does, it does not permit. The way in which certainly North American media and I read not only my own newspapers in Canada, I would read the New York Times on a daily basis, I would read the, uh, the British Guardian on a daily basis to try to assess what they're doing. And I'm realizing what they're lacking, or, or what their tendency is, is to treat this as a soccer game. This is what one team did, this is what the other team has did, and to report it, if you like, as a, as a refugee, with, with respect, as a refugee. <laughs> With a referee, <laughs> you'll for, you'll forgive my slurring of the, the mixing up of those two terms in, in in this case. And what is needed actually is the set of moral and legal values that judges this. And what we still see is, you know, the last time I saw a Canadian news reportage early on today, it will report the fourteen hundred. Um, uh, Israelis who've been killed. They don't make a distinguishment actually between the civilians and, uh, and soldiers who were killed with respect to that. Uh, but they, they will stress that they're civilians. And the number of what is now approaching 6,000 Palestinians usually is lumped as one single uh, sum. And without any distinguishing, for example, that if there are over 2,000 of those are children, over 1,800 of those uh, are women. And there's no differentiation with respect to that. There has been, obviously, the, the natural focus of a media would be on a human drama story. So the human drama, obviously, is the hostages, the release of several of them, the stories that have been told uh, with respect to the hostages, some of whom are Canadian, a number of whom are American. They get um, amplified um, uh, American press with regards to this. Um, there are very few reporters, let alone American reporters, uh, that are in Gaza. And very few of those reporters who are there have any background or context. I spent a great deal of my time during the first 10 days in Canada fielding calls from American 
and from Canadian uh, news reporters, and they would always say, look, my normal beat is Parliament Hill um, in, in Ottawa, or uh, on Congress in the United States. They, they need somebody quickly to do this. I've been to, um, I've been to Italy, so I guess I'm now a foreign, I have foreign experience, uh, but none of them have the background. And I would take the time to take them through. They say, well, what are the important things I have to know about this? But this is one person an yeah. answering them. There is, if you like, a memory hole with regards to this. There's a memory hole with respect to what, why there is a conflict. I can still remember um, being in Lebanon in the 1990s and encountering uh, a, an American editor who had been, was in the Middle East for the first time and uh, he was asked, I had just come back from doing some work in some of the Palestinian camps in and around Beirut, refugee camps, and he said, uh, he said, why are there all these Palestinians? Why don't they go back to Palestine? Um, uh, needless to say, I couldn't answer that question for him yeah. uh, short of two hours. Yeah. Um, Michael, I think maybe we need to move on, and then just one, com one quick comment, guys. Uh, forgive me about this, because this involves me as well, about the media. Uh, you know, we accept what you have said. If they offer us uh, this, this uh, field, or li like a, a soccer game, yeah. and then you tell uh, two sides of the story, we accept this. Now, yeah. even this, it, we are even deprived of it. And my anecdote, and then I finish by this, and then we open the floor for questions, is, is the following. During the, this crisis, they would call you, uh, the BBC, CBS from Canada, and others, uh, the producer, of course. And then they, they have very long chat with you, almost kind of interrogating you on the things that you are going to say. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you pass the vetting process, then they would do the interview. If not, then an email comes to you saying, apologies, we have different running order or something happened and so on so that. Anyway, so I had this interview with the NPR uh, after two long interviews with the producers, because that was like, and on the interview, I doubted the figures that we received from the Israeli sources about the Israeli civilians. They said we have 1,400 people killed, 200 soldiers, and uh, 1,200 civilians. Then I said, I, I am not doubting, I'm not saying civilians are not killed. I am doubting the figures. We need another party to verify these figures. Why is this? Because we had two other stories. Raping women and 40, 40 babies were beheaded. These two stories, coming from the same source, were proven to be fabricated. So I have the right, I have a stronger ground to doubt even the figures. Until now, by the way, we don't have these solid figures. And then, again, another Armageddon took place. They pulled down the, inter the interview from online and statements from the network from my university, unfortunately, condemning my position. And now my name is on in all these right-wing websites, you know, defaming me because I am doing this and because I am doubting even the figures. So what I am saying, we are even, they are not, we are not given this standard 101 journalism of, of saying the other side of the story or asking to verify any information. We have the right to ask a verification of, of any information, especially in times of war. I think I need to finish by this, otherwise I'm gonna carry on lecturing. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say one more thing, okay. and then um, uh, it's, all, it's all yours. And this goes, I think, to, to what you're saying. You know, it is, it is clear, and certainly in the narrative of, the, uh, of international media, that what Hamas has done on the 7th of October violated, uh, crime, violated the laws of war. Um, and that is repeated over and over again. The assumption, the widespread assumption among North American media is that Israel is a democracy, it lives by the rule of law, they accept the, they accept the comment that uh, the Israeli army operates by the international law whenever it commits actions uh, with respect to the Palestinians, and yes, there may be a doubt 
in some newspapers that perhaps the uh, Israelis have an have a, have a unfortunate blind spot when it comes to the uh, treatment of the Palestinians on some occasions. But that's how it's left. Nobody questions the, uh, the long documented history of how Israel is a bad faith occupier, that it, uh, in annexing um, uh, East Jerusalem and parts of the West Bank, it has committed the crime of aggression under the Rome Statute of 1998 in, in uh, creating over 300 settlements with over 720,000 Israeli settlers in East Jerusalem and the West Bank. It not, not only is a flagrant violation under international law as per the Security Council, it is also a war crime under the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, um, let alone the, uh, the way in which it conducts its wars that it does not distinguish, the, the, let me put it another way, the first and foremost rule of the laws of war, which we call international humanitarian law, the laws of war and the, and the, and the laws of occupation, is the absolute distinction that must be made between combatant and civilian. And you, are, you can only target combatants who are armed um, in, uh, in your attacks. If you uh, either target civilians or you are indiscriminate in how you attack combatants with, uh, with resulting major civilian lives, those would be mount to war crimes. I don't know how you can get to a death toll of close to 6,000 Palestinians in Gaza, over 2,000 children, over 1,800 women, um, the large, large proportion of those 6,000 being civilians and not see yourself uh, on a dock, a docket in The Hague sometime in the near future. And yet that's not the narrative because I wanted to go back to what you said, that's not the narrative that we find in the North American media. They do not, uh, and this is why I'm trying to write this crib sheet with respect to what the rules of, of, of war are and the absolute distinction between civilian and combatant. I'll leave it there and I'll okay, let you run the you questions. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so we are gonna take some questions. Please uh, put up your hands so that I... Do we have see, microphones? Okay. I think we have, yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna take one of each part. Okay, so, so let's start here, yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anastasia Zdeljanak is with you. Uh, professor, uh, if we study similar situations in history, uh, and please correct me if I am wrong, uh, we saw that either it requires a leader of exceptional standing, uh, like a Nelson Mandela, or a Martin Luther King, or a Gandhi, to resolve this uh, more peacefully, or we end up with a great power conflict that resolves it. Um, would you mind sharing your opinion on how you think uh, this situation will end up being resolved? Thank you. Can I see you know the hands so that we judge if we take more or one by one? Yeah, I guess we take maybe th uh, three questions in, in rounds and then we come back to Michael. Yeah, please go ahead. So. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Camille and I'm a Qatar Foundation alumnus. Um, you've mentioned that um, international law in principle should not be an umbrella folding at the first drop of rain and yet you also said that international law is selectively instrumentalized among Western policymakers. So when given this underlining contradiction, what's the general use of international law if it doesn't work? Especially now in the case of the enclave of Gaza. Thank you. Uh, yes, any ladies from this side? No? Okay. Samah Qamar from the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies had uh, the fortune to hear you, Dr. Link, a few days ago. This is a question appealing to you as an academic. 
So over the past two weeks, we witnessed countless US and to a certain extent Canadian, as a fellow Canadian, university presidents demonstrate what Joseph Kinchelow calls fixed, intractable, one-dimensional, and reductionistic perspectives on the events of October 7th and the war on Gaza. We saw university presidents like Harvard's being criticized not for not denouncing the actions of Hamas, but not denouncing their actions enough or the actions of seven or eight student groups who had different opinions to the exclusion of the representation of the complexity of the matter. So what we see now is McCarthy-like era actions happening in academia. What does it say when reputable universities that claim to be beacons of knowledge of socio-cultural and political norms? What does it mean for them to model practices that are so contradictory? How do we approach this phenomenon of university leaders' acts of historical amnesia, of epistemological hegemony, and the perpetuation uh, or the perpetration on intellectual freedom to the contradiction of what these universities stand for? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Michael, shall we take these three? Sure. And I'm, I didn't, I must confess, maybe the acoustics in the room, I think I've caught every question, um, but if I haven't, uh, uh, as I go through each of them, please, the questioner, make sure you, uh, you correct me on this. The first question, as I understood it, um, and you quote it um, appropriately, Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, was essentially how do we resolve this, uh, this conflict? Um, I always start from the premise, and I would repeat this often when I was Special Rapporteur, that at the end of the day we have to realize that there are seven million Israeli Jews living between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And there are seven million Palestinian Arabs who are living between the Mediterranean and the, uh, and the Jordan River as well. Neither is going anywhere. And the only way that they have a chance of being able to live with, uh, with a shared future of prosperity is by, by recognizing each other's common humanity, which means ending these structures of oppression, subjugation, and, uh, and occupation. One of the words that always causes me nausea when I listen to uh, the uh, reporting on the Middle East is another cycle of violence. This is never and not a cycle of violence. It's a structure of violence. And that's what I think we have to have at, uh, at, at I think, at the foremost of our focus as to what, what winds up having to be dismantled. Think of what the options are we have in front of us uh, for, a, uh, for what um, Israel and Palestine are gonna look like, say, in 20 years. Option number one is a genuine two-state solution. Uh, where Israel, where Palestine lives uh, in, um, as, a, as a sovereign, independent, contiguous state in, uh, in Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. That's one possibility. That's what's on the world's agenda right now. And that's, to my mind, where all, all that's needed left is to, is to issue the obituaries for that. That is, that is a, a long ways from ever coming to place because of the uh, extraordinary, not only the demographic presence of 720,000 Israeli settlers, but the political power that they now wield uh, in Israel. Number two is a genuine democratic state uh, for all, where all 14 million wind up having the democratic rights of, uh, particularly the right to vote, the right to, uh, to social services, the right to judicial uh, equality under the law. Um, that may seem to be, to some people, just as utopian, but my sense is, in many ways, that may be the easiest of all to achieve, particularly because of the promise that by having 14 million people with common uh, political rights and common constitutional and uh, legal rights, you've set yourself on the path for a, um, uh, uh, for a future of prosperity and recognizing each other's humanity and dignity. Number three is a one-state apartheid state, which is where we're rapidly heading towards right now, which would be the wish of most of the, of the center-right and right-wing leaders in, uh, uh, in Israel, where there would be only rights for uh, Israeli Jews, for the five million, 
five and a half million soon to be Palestinians living under occupation. They would have they either residence um, uh, permits or no fundamental rights whatsoever. Um, option number four would be a, what I call a state and a half solution, which is what the Trump plan promised, where the Palestinian, they would find some Palestinian quisling to agree to a little statelet that is the seven cities, basically from Janine in the north to Beth to Hebron in the south. You'd call that a state, maybe there'd be a, 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 a very thin corridor that goes from the highlands of the West Bank to the Jordan River to the Allenby Bridge, but that would be a statelet, and that's certainly what was promised by the uh, Trump plan. And the fifth and final option, because I can't think of any others, um, would be simply the continuation of what it is today, that Israel continues to manage the occupation. Um, uh, Western leaders keep on talking about the promise of we've got to keep the two-state solution open when the two-state solution has already been well and buried six feet under the ground. And we have, within, within 10 to 15 years, one million settlers there. Those strike me as the five solutions. I can't think of any other in all the years that I've been uh, working on that. And the only two that would ever uh, promise any kind of future peace um, and, uh, and mutual respect would be either a genuine two-state solution, which means the withdrawal of all of the settlers, the complete end to the occupation, or a one-state uh, one democratic solution with respect to this. And if, if I can just add one other word with respect to this, you know, given how greatly outnumbered in terms of not simply on diplomacy and, and economy, but militarily that the Palestinians are, you know, your, your invocation of Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela himself used uh, armed resistance in order, in part, in order to be able to bring down the apartheid South African regime. But civil disobedience has a long history in Palestine to it. I lived for six months in Bethlehem and went throughout the West Bank when I worked for UNRWA in 1989. And I saw the power of what civil disobedience and, and creative non-resistant, uh, creative resistance tactics could wind, wind up bringing. That would bring, I think, world opinion closer to understanding the Palestinian plight than any other. Uh, the second question that I had. Michael, if we can be quick because we have 10 minutes and so many. So many questions, so, yeah, yeah. so little time, yeah. okay. I, I, Look, you're, you're, you're talking to a legal academic. It takes us 15 <laughs> minutes just to clear my throat. You understand that? <laughs> okay, I'll try to be quick in the rest of my, uh, my answers to my questions. The second had to do with the contradiction with respect to international law, I think was over here. And you had mentioned that I, that I had mentioned the power of international law or the authority of international law, but also the weaknesses of international law as well. And I, I think when I probably said international law is closer to power than it is to justice. We cannot understand international law in its modern form, particularly in the way in which it's grown since 1945, without understanding that there's an inherent tension or contradiction within it. There is international rule of law, which is all the high aspirations that you and I would want to see. The fulfillment of, of, uh, of human rights, the, um, the use of international humanitarian law in a dynamic way to protect those civilians suffering uh, in, uh, in war zones. The use of international criminal law to be able to bring to, uh, to justice those who perpetrate crimes against humanity, the, war, the crimes of aggression, and war crimes as well. It always runs up against power and international rule by law, as opposed to international rule of law. If we understand that kind of contradiction, if we understand we're always within this struggle between power on the one hand and justice on the other. That helps us to explain why it is that the United States and some European countries can so fervently argue international law with respect to uh, the Russian annexation of Crimea, of uh, condemning the Russian invasion and occupation of, uh, of Ukraine, and yet entirely ignore that when it comes to uh, Israel and the countless UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions that occurred. Um, in his very eloquent memoirs, Kofi Annan 
said that at times of great crisis, particularly in the Middle East, the Security Council stood mute. And it was pr the paralysis that it suffered primarily rests on the, uh, on the lapse of the United States. The United States has taken a possessive view of the Israel-Palestine uh, file. It will not surrender it uh, uh, to others. And as one senior American foreign policy advisor, Aaron David Miller has said, Israel then acts, uh, sorry, the United States then acts as Israel's uh, um, lawyer uh, in these cases. So I want you to aspire to the very best that international law uh, uh, can wind up offering. At its very best, it is a high moral guide for all of us in the world. It's the promise that nations make to one another and to their own citizens that they'll live up to these ideals and to these written statements. But very often it falls far short of that because power still has a significant role in the world. The third question I think came from over here with respect to student groups in Canada and the United States um, that have been attacked by media, then attacked by and condemned by their own university administrations for making statements with respect to the support they've given to, um, to Palestine over the course of the last couple of weeks. Um, I can't speak definitively with respect to the United States. I do know they have had in the past broad protection for, for, the, uh, uh, for, th for the First Amendment freedom of expression. I do know in Canada, under our own Charter of Rights, we have very broad protection as defined by our own Supreme Court of Canada with respect to freedom of expression and freedom of opinion with respect to this. I say that as a lawyer thinking that's a, that's a case I'd love to fight three, three years down the road. In the meanwhile, we're going to see lots of students' reputations being smeared by having attached their names to these, um, uh, to these petitions. And I know in the United States, there was an article in the New York Times the other day where law students at um, Harvard uh, and at Columbia and at Cornell who had put their names on, Palestinian, on p petitions in support of Palestine now were having their jobs at law firms withdrawn because of that kind of support. Again, you know, I, I hate to say this, but you know, it comes to, to except for Palestine. You can have wide ranging debates, um, and I, I'm somebody who actually studies as a lawyer um, uh, academic freedom and, it's, uh, and how broad it's supposed to be. But in, I, my sense is that we're right now in a, in a very f fertile moment of extreme views being expressed, particularly uh, within the press in North America and by groups that are defending Israel. Um, I think, in, I'm hoping, in moments to come, and particularly with a legal pushback, that some of that will be withdrawn with respect to this, and universities will learn how to be a little more detached and neutral when it comes to allowing the scope of freedom of expression on campuses. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, Yes, we are going to have maybe this final round. Uh, so, yes, please, in the middle here. Hello, thank you. Um, two questions, if I may, quick ones, I promise. Uh, the first question is, um, you know, we hear a lot about terrorism versus war crimes. Um, Last week, for example, I was in New York um, visiting this international organization that advocates for justice, and I was struck by how one of the members, one of the sort of leadership members there, said that what Hamas has done is terrorism, what Israel's doing is war crimes. So as an international lawyer, what, 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 would, what would you say is the best sort of international lawyerly response to that kind of uh, statement? And my second question is with regard to the International Court of Justice. We know that Canada and the Netherlands has supported the, um, the case against Russia for genocide there. The same has done, done the same for the case against Myanmar, which was brought by the Gambia. Now, whether Canada and the Netherlands will do the same for um, Israel's genocidal intent, uh, I think we both know the answer to that. But given that any state can approach the International Court of Justice 
for Israel's violation of uh, you know the yeah. the genocide convention. What do you what do you think? Do you think that that's a probability? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this side. Yeah. Quickly, please. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, just a very similar question. So I think both of you uh, have done a great job of explaining the relevant uh, international legal issues and why both sides here might have been guilty of committing some offenses. Could you just very briefly on a similar point give us an overview of how this could play out realistically in terms of consequences under international law? Thank you. And this side? Uh, yes, please, yeah. Like in the middle, yes. And then the last one is Najwa, because of bias, clear bias, she's one of my great students. You know? <laughs> uh, so there's no doubt that Gaza and the Palestinian issue is a uh, humanitarian crisis at the moment. Um, and it's come as a result of a large uh, political and diplomatic crisis as well. But what grounding do employers have on uh, limiting their employees on being able to express uh, humanitarian solidarity with the Palestinian people right now? Yes, uh, here in the front row, please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you sure? All right. All right. Okay, let, uh, here. Okay, okay. We take, we take, we take both of you. Okay, All right, I'll take, be very quick until they bring yeah, back the mic over the there. Please, go ahead. Uh, so I'm sure you've seen the viral tweet as useless as international law. As if international law is useless, and that would be dependent on your responses to the people that asked before me. Where should the game be played? You mentioned your role as special rapporteur. I've dealt with a lot of special rapporteurs that have written extensively on Qatar, and that seems to shake the entire universe's perception of the country. It's not working when it comes with Israel. Is it because of the media's role in all of this? I know you've, you've uh, seen a shift in terms of the language and what people say in the media and in just the common language in the street. So is the game to be played with the media? Is that where the push should be if international law is not a way to get justice? Okay. Okay. The final say <laughs> in terms of questions. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hello. Okay. okay. Um, so right now, Human Rights Watch is currently tracking um, instances of companies like Meta controlling and um, muting whatever uh, voices they disagree with. It seems. Um, do you think, if found guilty? Uh, do you think that international law can be used to address this? Okay, thank, thank you very much. Some of your questions, I think, overlap, and I may try to answer them as in, uh, in combination with respect to this. I think the first question had to do with terrorism as used by lawyers and, um, and what's the legal basis for terrorism. Um, Terrorism is, is sometimes defined in, in, in national law. I know we have a definition of terrorism in, uh, in Canada, in our criminal code, that's been there for the last 15 or 20 years. In fact, some of you may have heard of this, there's a trial that's going on based on a case in my hometown, London, Ontario, where a young man influenced by the dark web two and a half years ago used his truck to run down and kill four members of a Muslim, a Pakistani Canadian family. And this trial's been going on now for the last two months. And he's not only charged with first degree murder of the four people that he killed, but also on the additional charge of, uh, of terrorism. And it's the first trial in Canada to judge them on that. Terrorism is not as well developed a term in international law. We see the term terrorism occasionally mentioned in UN resolutions, but there is no convention uh, with respect to terrorism. Um, there is, um, I know there's a, one of my spe fellow special rapporteurs was concerned with issues involving counterterrorism and its impact upon uh, human rights, but it doesn't have the same gravitas as a legal term as say, um, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or, uh, or genocide. So it still is largely at the, if you like, the political rhetorical level when we use terrorism in international law. Unfortunately, as you know, then that terrorism then does get used and it becomes an adjective 
you use before Palestinian, um, but you never hear war crime used as an adjective then uh, before, um, before Israel. And this goes to what you've been raising with respect to the double standard with regards to this. Um, a couple of you have asked, and this may be just a way of, of, of collapsing a lot of these questions. Basically what I'm hearing you saying is when it comes to international law, what is to be done? You know, it's one thing for an international lawyer to get up and pronounce on international law and what it can and, and doesn't do or what it says and doesn't say, but there are emerging legal forms that you've got to be aware of because each of them has the question of Palestine on its agenda. Number one, obviously, is the International, court of, uh, is the International Criminal Court in The Hague, created, um, it, it came into being in 2002, created by the 1998 Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which has a very long, distinct list um, defining war crimes, crimes against humanity, the crime of aggression, uh, and, uh, and so on. And in 2021, a pre-trial chamber of the International uh, Criminal Court said that, the, uh, that the, because of Palestine's ascension to the Rome Statute Treaty, um, they have jurisdiction since June of 2014 over any alleged war crimes or war crimes against humanity on the soil of the, uh, of the occupied Palestinian territory. It was backdated by when Palestine applied in order to capture the 2014 summer war uh, on, uh, on Gaza. Um, now, unfortunately, when it comes to law, the sun rises slowly. This has been on the agenda of now the third uh, chief prosecutor who, um, who has a very storied history. Uh, his name is Kareem Khan. He's a British barrister, very well thought of. His grandfather was actually on the UNSCOP committee, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine in 1947, representing India before the partition. And he was one of the three that voted against the partition of, uh, of Palestine. He has, uh, alas, put Palestine on the back burner and has spent a great deal of the resources that he has uh, building a case with respect to Russia and, uh, and Ukraine. Um, I know he made a statement roughly 10 days ago, generally a question of warning, but he ha his warnings have not been nearly as strict or as severe as his predecessor by the Senegalese uh, prosecutor, Ben Souda. Um, so he's been pressured recently by Palestinian human rights organizations to move this file along. I'm not even sure it was on the back burner. It may have been further back than the back burner on, on the stove to try to push it on, onto the front burner. And this may be the impetus that he winds up needing. Keep in mind that the Statute of Rome uh, prosecutes individuals, not states. So the very easiest of all of the war crimes and crimes against humanity that can be brought against Israel, and the one that I think he probably would lead with, is settlements. Settlements is so clearly a war crime, not only based on the 1998 Rome Statute, but also on the 1977 additional protocols to the 49, 1949 Geneva Convention. Uh, any country that either transfers civilians into or encourages the movement of civilians of its own population into occupied territory is committing a grave breach under the international humanitarian law and a grave breach is a war crime and that's been solidified by the, by the 1998 um, Rome Statute. He also has on his file Gaza from 2014, Gaza from 2018, Gaza from 2021, and presumably also Gaza from two, 2023 uh, uh, as well. Um, so that's the International uh, Criminal Court. Um, uh, and, of course, Israel is not a member of the uh, International Criminal Court. Indeed, when the Rome Statute was signed 25 years ago, this past uh, 25 years ago in July of, of 1998, 
the delegate, the chief delegate of Israel, got up and said, we as a country would love to have signed the Rome Statute. However, in all the heinous crimes of war that you've put in there, you've put in this transferring of, uh, of civilians into occupied territory, therefore we cannot sign. Israel knew from the beginning that its culpability would be there. Time will, I'm, so I'm, I'm afraid to say time will tell as to where this goes. The other major court is the International Court of Justice, also in The Hague, and sometimes the two of them wind up being confused with each other. The International Criminal Court is the highest judicial body in the UN uh, legal system. It was around uh, and created after the Treaty for Zai as the world, initially known as the World Court of Justice, then became the International Court of Justice. In December 30th, 2022, the UN General Assembly adopted a majority resolution, a, ma a resolution by majority vote to ask what is called an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice on the questions of uh, several important questions. Those of you who know your, your uh, international diplomacy will know that there was a, that the International Court of Justice in 2004 issued an advisory opinion on the status, the legal status of the wall. And it said, eight, because 85% of the wall is in occupied territory, therefore it's basically its location is illegal. It also said in passing that the settlements are illegal. We now have a much broader, much more comprehensive question being put to the International Court of uh, Justice. It is asking um, basically three questions. What is the legal status of the Israeli annexation, both de jure of Jerusalem, but also de the de facto annexation that Israel is conducting in the West Bank, number one. Number two is, what is the legal status of Israel's refusal to permit Palestinian self-determination? And number three is, and this is the most intriguing one, I think, what is the legal status of Israel's entrenched system of discrimination? It doesn't use the word apartheid but it talks about entrenched discrimination. But in the written statement, that, so that was sent to the court in early this year. Then the court has asked for written, um, written submissions, written statements. So there have been 57 written statements issued by 54 countries and three international organizations that were submitted by the deadline of July 25th, 2023. Most of them were friendly to the question of Palestine. Palestine issued, I think, a 374 page uh, written submission on its first round. The only other country, the only country that surpassed that in terms of length, anybody wanna guess? Hmm? Rwanda, no. What country are we in now? Qatar? Qatar. Qatar issued a phenomenal brief that was a little over 400 pages. Maybe they want to be more Palestinian than the, than the Palestinians, I thought. But they, they offered a superb brief. Just to, just to give you a couple of other examples, South Africa and Namibia each uh, issued separate written statements, primarily devoted to the question of apartheid. And their statements I thought were really top drawer uh, with respect to this. So of the 57 submissions, um, I think the three, st the three organizations were the African Union, the League of Arab States, and the, um, and the COI, the uh, organization of OCI, the Organization uh, for Islamic Cooperation, OIC. Um, and there were, th there were, I think, approximately 13 unfriendly statements that were issued. <coughs> and uh, you, you'll probably be surprised by every one that I mention. The United States, the United Kingdom, um, uh, and some of these major powers, what else there? They were the Marshall Islands, Palu, um, 
Vanuatu, Fiji, uh, these, and, and I, I swear, and I, I, I say this you know, with, with no respect, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I would bet you a thousand to one that the submission by Fiji was actually written in a foreign office in, uh, in Tel Aviv. It, yeah, it, it was, the harshness of it, it surprised me, and I have no reason to think that there's any bad, bad blood between Palestine and Fiji. The vast majority of them, approximately 35 nations, were, were friendly in whole or in part to the Palestine submission. And basically what it, it asked for is, uh, what are the legal consequences of each of these questions being answered? And what are the legal consequences with respect to the status, the legal status of the occupation of Palestine? In other words, for the first time ever, the International Court of Justice is going to be asked, um, uh, is the occupation illegal? We all know that aspects of the occupation are illegal, the settlements, the annexation, but nobody, no judicial body has ever said before the, the occupation itself is illegal. And if the occupation itself is illegal, as per the International Court of Justice, I like to think this is one of those vocabulary changing moments, just like apartheid will be. So the court earlier this week announced that the hearings will be held during the week of February 19th. Probably it's gonna take a whole week in The Hague. And I would guess sometime between August and November, the court will make its decision. I wanna to say to you, and, and believe me, this is coming from an international lawyer, International law alone will not liberate Palestine. But international law, together with international resolve, will do so. And we've seen so many examples of that in the last 30 years. International law is what has been missing over the last 30 years, longer than that, but certainly since the Oslo process. The whole Oslo process was built on real politique. Let the stronger party negotiate with the much weaker party without the guardrails of international law. If we get the kind of judgment we hope to get from the International Court of Justice, this will provide the guardrails where we can only, where Israel is not allowed to argue how many settlements it gets to keep, how much of East Jerusalem it's allowed to uh, hang on to. International law would say annexation is illegal, uh, the settlements are illegal, the, uh, the settlers are, are illegal, the, uh, the demographic engineering of Palestine is illegal, and Israel must negotiate for a complete, unconditional, immediate withdrawal of the, of the occupation. And I hope, as my last words, that gives you with some hope. I have learned so often as Special Rapporteur, I would give these 40-minute lectures uh, of very detailed, very factual, and everybody wanted to slit their wrist at the end. <laughs> I've learned how important it is to make sure people leave with some hope at the end, and I hope I've given that to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Michael, uh, really, this, uh, this was a great uh, end with the need for international resolve, so every one of us should take part in this. This is a very um, inspirational, let's say, um, statement. And I want you to join me one more time in thanking you, Michael.